Chapter Twenty Seven of the Witness for the Defence by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Seven: The Verdict. Six, seven, eight," said Mister Hazlewood, counting the letters which he had already written since breakfast and placing them on the salver which Hubbard was holding out to him. He was a very different man this morning from the Mr. Hazlewood of yesterday. He shone, complacent and serene. He leaned back in his chair and gazed mildly at the butler. "'There must be an answer to the problem which I put to you, Hubbard.' Hubbard wrinkled his brows in thought, and succeeded only in looking a hundred and ten years old. He had the melancholy look of a molting bird. He shook his head and drooped. "'No doubt, sir,' he said. "'But as far as you are concerned,' Mr. Hazlewood continued briskly, "'you can throw no light upon it?' "'Not a glimmer, sir.' Mr. Hazlewood was disappointed, and with him disappointment was petulance. "'That is unlike you, Hubbard,' he said, "'for sometimes after I have been deliberating for days over some curious and perplexing conundrum, you have solved it the moment it has been put to you hubbard drooped still lower he began the droop as a bow of acknowledgment but forgot to raise his head again it is very good of you sir he said he seemed oppressed by the goodness of mr hazlewood yet you are not clever hubbard not at all clever no sir i know my place returned the butler and Mr. Hazlewood continued with a little envy. "'You must have some wonderful gift of insight which guides you straight to the inner meaning of things.' "'It's just common sense, sir,' said Hubbard. "'But I haven't got it,' cried Mr. Hazlewood. "'How's that?' "'You don't need it, sir. You are a gentleman,' Hubbard replied, and carried the letters to the door. There, however, he stopped. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' he said, "'but a new parcel of the prison walls has arrived this morning. "'Shall I unpack it?' Mr. Hazlewood frowned and scratched his ear. "'Well, uh, no, Hubbard, no,' he said, with a trifle of discomfort. "'I am not sure, indeed, that the prison walls is not almost one of my mistakes. "'We all make mistakes, Hubbard. "'I think you shall burn that parcel, Hubbard.' somewhere where it won't be noticed certainly sir said hubbard i'll burn it under the shadow of the south wall mr hazlewood looked up with a start was it possible that hubbard was poking fun at him the mere notion was incredible and indeed hubbard shuffled with so much meekness from the room that mr hazlewood dismissed it he went across the hall to the dining-room where he found henry thresk trifling with his breakfast no embarrassment weighed upon mr hazlewood this morning he effervesced with good humour i do not blame you mr thresk he said for the side you took yesterday afternoon you were a stranger to us in this house i understand your position i am not quite so sure mr hazlewood said thresk dryly that i understand yours for my part i have not closed my eyes all night you on the other hand seem to have slept well i did indeed said hazlewood i was relieved from a strain of suspense under which i have been labouring for a month past to have refused my consent to richard's marriage with stella ballantyne on no other grounds than that social prejudice forbade it would have seemed a complete a stupendous reversal of my whole theory and conduct of life i should have become an object of ridicule people would have laughed at the philosopher of little beading i have heard their laughter all this month now however once the truth is known no one will be able to say henry thresk looked up from his plate aghast do you mean to say mr hazlewood that after mrs ballantyne has told her story you mean to make that story public mr hazlewood stared in amazement at henry thresk but of course he said oh you can't be thinking of it but i am i must do it there is so much at stake replied hazlewood what the whole consistency of my life i must make it clear that i am not acting upon prejudice or suspicion or fear of what the world will say or for any of the conventional reasons which might guide other men 
to thresk this point of view was horrible and there was no arguing against it it was inspired by the dreadful vanity of a narrow shallow nature and thresk's experience had never shown him anything more difficult to combat and overcome so for the sake of your reputation for consistency you will make a very unhappy woman bear shame and obloquy which she might easily be spared you could find a thousand excuses for breaking off the marriage you put the case very harshly mr thresk said hazlewood but you have not considered my position and he went indignantly back to the library thresk shrugged his shoulders after all if dick hazlewood turned his back upon stella she would not hear the abuse or suffer the shame that she would take the dark journey as he declared he could not doubt and no one could prevent her not even he himself though his heart might break at her taking it all depended upon dick he appeared a few minutes afterwards fresh from his ride glowing with good humour and contentment but the sight of thresk surprised him hello he cried good morning i thought you were going to catch the eight forty five i felt lazy answered thresk i sent off some telegrams to put off my engagements good said dick and he sat down at the breakfast table as he poured out a cup of tea thresk said i think i heard you were over thirty yes thirty's a good age said thresk it looks back on youth answered dick that's just what i mean remarked thresk do you mind a cigarette not at all thresk smoked and while he smoked he talked not carelessly yet careful not to emphasize his case youth is a graceful thing of high-sounding words and impetuous thoughts but like many other graceful things it can be very hard and very cruel dick hazlewood looked closely and quickly at his companion but he answered casually it is supposed to be generous and it is to itself replied thresk generous when its sympathies are enlisted generous so long as all goes well with it generous because it is confident of triumph but its generosity is not a matter of judgment it does not come from any wide outlook upon a world where there is a good deal to be said for everything it is a matter of physical health yes said dick and once affronted once hurt youth finds it difficult to forgive so far both men had been debating on an abstract topic without any immediate application to themselves but now dick leaned across the table with a smile upon his face which thresk did not understand and why do you say this to me this morning mr thresk he asked pointedly yes it's rather an impertinence isn't it thresk agreed but i was looking into a case late last night in which irrevocable and terrible things are going to happen if there is not forgiveness dick took his cigarette case from his pocket i see he remarked and struck a match both men rose from the table and at the door dick turned your case of course has not yet come on he said no answered thresk but it will very soon they went into the library and mr hazlewood greeted his son with a vivacity which for weeks had been absent from his demeanour did you ride this morning he asked yes but stella didn't she sent word over that she was tired i must go across and see how she is mr hazlewood interposed quickly there is no need of that my boy she is coming here this morning oh dick looked at his father in astonishment she said no word of it to me last night and i saw her home i suppose she sent word over about that too he looked from one to the other of his companions but neither answered him some uneasiness indeed was apparent in them both oh ho he said with a smile stella's coming over and i know nothing of it mr thresk's lazy so remains at little beading and delivers a lecture to me over breakfast and you father seem in remarkable spirits mr hazlewood seized upon the opportunity to interrupt his son's reflections i am my boy he cried i walked in the fields this morning and but he got no further with his explanations 
for the sound of mrs pettifer's voice rang high in the hall and she burst into the room harold i have only a moment a good morning mr thresk she cried in a breath i have something to say to you thresk was disturbed suppose that stella came while mrs pettifer was here she must not speak in mrs pettifer's presence somehow mrs pettifer must be dismissed no such anxiety however harassed mr hazlewood say it margaret he said smiling benignantly upon her you cannot annoy me this morning i am myself again and dick's eyes turned sharply upon him all my old powers of observation have returned my old interest in the great dark riddle of human life has reawakened the brain the sedulous active brain resumes its work to-day asking questions probing problems i rose early margaret he flourished his hands like one making a speech and walking in the fields amongst the cows a most curious speculation forced itself upon my mind how is it i asked myself it seemed that mr hazlewood was destined never to complete a sentence that morning for margaret pettifer at this point banged her umbrella upon the floor stop talking harold and listen to me i have been speaking with robert and we withdraw all opposition to dick's marriage mr hazlewood was dumbfounded you margaret you of all people he stammered yes she replied decisively robert likes her and robert is a good judge of a woman that's one thing then i believe dick is going to take st quentin's isn't that so dick yes answered dick that's the house we looked over yesterday well it's not a couple of hundred yards from us and it would not be comfortable for any of us if dick and dick's wife were strangers so i give in there dick she went across the room and held out her hand to him i am going to call on stella this afternoon dick flushed with pleasure that's splendid aunt margaret i knew you were all right you know you put on a few frills at first of course but you were forgiven mr hazlewood made so complete a picture of dismay that dick could not but pity him he went across to his father now sir he said let us hear this problem the old man was not proof against the invitation you shall richard he exclaimed you are the very man to hear it your aunt richard is of too practical a mind for such speculations it's a most curious problem hubbard quite failed to throw any light upon it i myself am i confess bewildered and i wonder if a fresh young mind can help us to a solution he patted his son on the shoulder and then took him away by the arm the fresh young mind will have a go father said dick fire away i was walking in the fields my boy yes sir among the cows exactly you put your finger on the very point how is it i asked myself that's quite your old style father now isn't it richard isn't it mr hazlewood dropped dick's arm he warmed to his theme he caught fire he assumed the attitude of the orator how is it that with the advancement of science and the progress of civilization a cow gives no more milk to-day than she did at the beginning of the christian era with outspread arms he asked for an answer and the answer came a fresh young mind can solve that problem in two shakes it is because the laws of nature forbid that's your trouble father that's the great drawback to sentimental enthusiasm it's always up against the laws of nature dick said mrs pettifer by some extraordinary miracle you are gifted with common sense i am off she went away in a hurricane as she had come and it was time that she did go for even while she was closing the door stella ballantyne came out from her cottage to cross the meadow dick was the first to hear the gate click as she unlatched it and passed into the garden he took a step towards the window but his father interposed and for once with a real authority no richard he said wait with us here mrs ballantyne has something to tell us i thought so said dick quietly and he came back to the other two men 
let me understand his face was grave but without anger or any confusion stella returned here last night after i had taken her home yes said thresk to see you yes and my father came down and found you together yes i heard voices mr hazelwood hurriedly interposed and so naturally i came down dick turned to his father that's all right father i didn't think you were listening at the keyhole i am not blaming anybody i want to know exactly where we are that's all stella found the little group awaiting her and standing up before them she told her story as she had told it last night to thresk she omitted nothing nor did she falter she had trembled and cried for a great part of the night over the ordeal which lay before her but now that she had come to it she was brave her composure indeed astonished thresk and filled him with compassion he knew that the very roots of her heart were bleeding only once or twice did she give any sign of what these few minutes were costing her her eyes strayed towards dick hazelwood's face in spite of herself but she turned them away again with a wrench of her head and closed her eyelids lest she should hesitate and fail all listened to her in silence and it was strange to thresk that the one man who seemed least concerned of the three was dick hazelwood himself he watched stella all the while she was speaking but his face was a mask not a gesture or movement gave a clue to his thoughts when stella had finished he asked composedly why didn't you tell me all this at the beginning stella and now she turned to him in a burst of passion and remorse oh dick i tried to tell you i made up my mind so often that i would but i never had the courage i am terribly to blame i hid it all from you yes but oh you meant so much to me you yourself dick it wasn't your position it wasn't what you brought with you other people's friendship other people's esteem it was just you 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 i longed for you to want me as i wanted you then she recovered herself and stopped she was doing the very thing she had resolved not to do she was pleading she was making excuses she drew herself up and with a dignity which was quite pitiful she now pleaded against herself but i don't ask for your pity you mustn't be merciful i don't want mercy dick that's of no use to me i want to know what you think just what you really and truthfully think that's all i can stand alone if i must oh yes i can stand alone and as thresk stirred and moved knowing well in what way she meant to stand alone stella turned her eyes full upon him in warning nay in menace i can stand alone quite easily dick you mustn't think that i should suffer so very much i shouldn't i shouldn't in spite of her control a sob broke from her throat and her bosom heaved and then dick hazelwood went quietly to her side and took her hand i didn't interrupt you stella i wanted you to tell everything now once for all so that no one of us three need ever mention a word of it again stella looked at dick hazelwood in wonder and then a light broke over her face like the morning his arm slipped around her waist and she leaned against him suddenly weak almost a swooning mr hazelwood started up from his chair in consternation but you heard her richard yes father i heard her he answered but you see stella is my wife your mr hazelwood's lips refused to speak the word he fell back again in his chair and dropped his face in his hands oh no it's true said dick i have rooms in london you know i went to london last week stella came up on monday it was my doing my wish stella is my wife mr hazelwood groaned aloud but she has tricked you richard and stella agreed yes i tricked you dick i did she said miserably and she drew herself from his arm but he caught her hand no you didn't he led her over to his father that's where you both make your mistake stella tried to tell me something on the very night 
when we walked back from this house to her cottage and i asked her to marry me she has tried again often during the last weeks i knew very well what it was before you turned against her before i married her she didn't trick me mr hazlewood turned in despair to henry thresk what do you say he asked that i am very glad you asked me here to give my advice on your collection thresk answered i was inclined yesterday to take a different view of your invitation but i did what perhaps i may suggest you should do i accepted the situation he went across to stella and took her hands oh thank you she cried thank you and now thresk turned to dick if i might look at a bradshaw i could find out the next train to london certainly said dick and he went over to the writing table stella and henry thresk were left alone for a moment we shall see you again she said please thresk laughed no doubt i am not going out into the night you know my address if you don't ask mr hazlewood it's in king's bench walk isn't it and he took the timetable from dick hazlewood's hand end of chapter twenty seven recording by nicholas clifford middlebury vermont u s a End of the Witness for the Defense by A. E. W. Mason.